And so I'm Jane. Um, I, I work at Julia Computing, and so part of my, my job with Julia Computing is to do teaching and outreach. So I, I do different versions of this introductory tutorial a bit. Um, before I started with Julia Computing, I was a user of Julia, and I've been using Julia for just about two years. Uh, prior to that, I was a Python user. Um, I still use Python now, too. Um, I, I started learning how to code as part of my graduate research. Uh, so I came to grad school as an experimentalist, and then uh, found that I needed to, to learn some scripting to process my data. And, uh, and so I started learning Python by way of a couple of edX and Coursera courses. Um, but it wasn't until you know, my second year of graduate school or something that I, I wrote my first for loop. So I really had no experience with so programming sorry. until then. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to, to know a little bit about the backgrounds of the people in the room. Is there anybody here that doesn't have much experience with, with Python that came to PyData because they wanted to learn about Python but aren't really using it yet? Or is everybody, okay, so everybody here is a, a solid Python user, it looks like. Okay. Are there other languages here that, or amongst the people in the room, are there other languages that you're using regularly other than Python? Like are there, you know, R users or, okay. MATLAB users? Uh, what about lower level languages like Fortran or C? Okay, so some of you. All right. And of the people in the room, who here is a physical scientist? All right. Engineer? And I guess a data scientist, broadly? All right. Uh, let's see, computer scientists? What about people in social sciences? And if you didn't raise your hand, um, Feel free to call out. What are, what are you studying or researching or working in? Oh, okay. So anyone else in finance? Is that a popular one? Okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you for, for coming today to, to learn a little bit about Julia. I'm going to start by doing a, a quick intro so we have a sense of you know, what Julia is and why we might be interested in learning Julia. And, um, and after that, we'll hop into the tutorial materials themselves. Um, and so... I'll start by going over you know, why we might want to learn another language, why Julia is getting, has been developed in the first place. Uh, then we'll talk about an application of Julia and see what it's like to use Julia in practice before going on to Julia Box, where we have Jupyter Notebooks with all of our material. Uh, so this first question of you know, why do we want another language? Um, here I have a, a periodic table of languages where we have a, a bunch of different programming languages organized together and, and color-coded by the features or the characteristics that they have. And so the natural question then is, you know, with all of these programming languages out there, um, all bringing different things to the table, why did the creators of Julia and, you know, broadly the open source community developing Julia in the ecosystem uh, decide that it was a worthwhile project? What does Julia bring to the table that we don't already have with the existing languages out there? Um, and the idea is that, you know, even with all the different tools that are out there, uh, we still have something called the two language problem. Um, and so I'll, I'll define a bit what this two-language problem is. It, it comes from the idea that traditionally languages are either performant or productive. Um, where on the one hand, you know, we have these lower level languages like Fortran and C that allow us to write you know, really efficient code. Um, but if we want to be efficient as programmers and you know, be able to, to do our work productively, um, it's often easier to work in a higher level language like you know, Python or MATLAB. Um, but the trade-off that we're faced with isn't truly just a trade-off between performance and productivity because um, we also have to consider generality. Um, so if you're working with you know, just a special library or a domain-specific language, um, you know, a tool like you know, NumPy, for example, will allow you to get really great performance and also be able to work in like, a high-level environment. Um, but then the scope of the tool that you're working with will be limited. So this is really the, the trade-off that we're faced with, uh, performance, productivity versus generality. Um, and the classical workaround is, you know, if you, if you need all of these things, if you want to work in a general purpose language that is both really fast and easy to use, um, people will, will, will work with two different languages. Well, they'll start with, you know, a language that they can prototype in, um, a language like Python or MATLAB. And once they get to a point where they really need their computations to hit scale, um, to, to do something at production level, they'll then switch to a lower level language like C or Fortran. And so they end up working in two different languages to get all of their work done, which introduces this you know, obvious redundancy and um, extra work in their workflow. Um, and so this is the reason that Julia has been developed. The idea is, or rather the, the tagline for Julia is, you know, looks like Python, feels like Lisp, and runs like 
see your Fortran. And I'll talk you through what, what we mean when we, when, when we make these claims. Um, the, the idea, though, is that you know, Julia offers productivity, generality, and performance. And so we can talk about you know, Julia's performance uh, first. So one of the, uh, the notebooks that we'll do as part of the tutorial is a notebook where we'll benchmark different implementations of the sum function, um, where a sum function is just taking some vector that we can call A, and it's adding together all the different elements of that vector. And for the purpose of benchmarking, uh, when we we look at how fast this operation runs in, in Python and C and Julia side by side. Um, for the purpose of benchmarking, we'll use a 10 million element vector and see how long that calculation takes to run. And so if we're just talking about you know, using the same you know, simple algorithm with our own implementation of, of summing things together um, in C, we can do this operation with a 10 million element vector in about 10 milliseconds. Um, it takes you know, more than an order of magnitude longer when we go to Python with, you know, handwritten code. Um, if we do a handwritten implementation in Julia, we get back down to order of 10 milliseconds. So we're approaching C speeds <coughs> there. And the next thing that we say that Julia offers is productivity. And if you look at the implementations of our sum function in Python and in Julia side by side, uh, what we see is that they're really not that different. So I've put in bold the, the actual differences in our code here where it's basically, between a colon and a couple different uh, required keywords, uh, where you have def and the colon and the Python side, and then you know the function and the end keywords and the Julia side. But you know otherwise we can express ourselves in the same you know, high level manner. Um, and it was really it was this sort of difference between Python and Julia code that got me really motivated to start learning Julia, um, because as I said I was coming from a Python background, and uh, and at some point I. I had a friend who had been really excited about Julia. He had been using previously MATLAB and C and switching off back and forth between the two languages. Uh, he, he went to Julia, he was really excited about the language, and at some point um, in expressing his enthusiasm to me, he took a piece of code that I had in Python and then translated it to Julia. And, and like the syntactic changes that he actually had to make in order to convert my code to Julia were really minor, but he got more than an order of magnitude speed improvement in the thing that I had written. Uh, so that was what got me really excited about, about learning Julia, because I felt like you know, I wouldn't have to make that many changes to the way that I wrote code, um, but that I would still be able to get a, a speed bump. And I was starting to hit a bottleneck in some of my computations. So that was why I started learning a second language. Um, and then this third thing that we said that Julia offers is generality. And, uh, and this is what we mean when we say that working in Julia feels like working in a lisp. Uh, because Julia offers metaprogramming facilities uh, that allow you to program with macros, for example. Um, the design paradigm of, of Julia is multiple dispatch. Um, and the fact that Julia is generally a you know, general and an expressive language is what allows Julia to be mostly written in Julia itself. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about the fact that Julia is mostly written in Julia itself is that this really starts to, to help blur the line between users and developers of the language. So a lot of our most important developers of the language are people who came often as graduate students um, and users to the language and then found that they wanted to start you know, making contributions because they wanted to tweak things to work better for their purposes. And the idea is that because you know, Julia is Julia, when you start to look under the hood, uh, there's not this extra barrier to, to looking under the hood and starting to make those tweaks. Um, so the application of Julia that I always like to talk about uh, is the Celeste Research Project. So the Celeste Project took data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, which was an effort to collect data on, I think, 35% of the visible sky. Um, and so, you know, they, they, over the course of this survey, uh, gathered about 178 terabytes of data. So it was a pretty huge data set, and this, this is Pi data, so I probably don't need to emphasize how large 178 terabytes is, and they're probably several of you working with even larger data sets, but um, to, to give a sense of scale, because I like to help myself visualize uh, scale here, um, this is you know, 10 to the 14 bytes, um, order of 25,000 DVDs worth of data, and a really silly statistic that I like to include is that if you wanted to print a data set this large on written paper, it would take you hundreds of thousands of pickup trucks to carry that, that paper. Uh, but the point is there was this big data set lying around in the first you know, 10 or so years that it was in existence, there wasn't a whole lot done with it or it wasn't treated systematically. Um, but then this team of researchers came together 
uh, to form the Celestial Research Team. And what they did was that they cataloged 188 million stars and galaxies from this database. And they did that using Julia to write all of their software and then NERSC supercomputers up at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the Bay Area to, to run all of their Julia code. Um, now, the thing that's, that's cool about this, besides the fact that you know, they were able to do a project of this scale and doing this huge cataloging, is that the entire calculation that generated this catalog took under 15 minutes. Um, again, this was you know, using, using huge machines up at, at NERSC, um, where they were able to break the petaflop barrier. So this made Julia the third language to join the petaflop club after C and Fortran. And, uh, and to do this whole calculation, they used over a million threads and over 9,000 nodes. So it gives us a sense of Julia's ability to, to distribute. Um, so, so the next question then is, like, why was Julia important on the Celeste project? And you know, what would the Celeste project have looked like if you know, some other tool or set of tools had been used? Um, and maybe the, the first natural answer to that question is, like, well, if, if Julia hadn't been the language of choice, then maybe there would have been two different languages used, and there would have needed to be some, you know, trade-off between you know, working in Python and then you know, moving, moving to C. Um, and that's true um, that you know, there was this sort of natural, there would have otherwise been some sort of natural you know, um, inefficiency, I guess, in needing to, to recode things from, from Python to C, for example. Um, but really the impact, I think, of using Julia on this project was more profound than that because what it did was that in bringing together this huge team of researchers uh, who came from very different backgrounds, some were you know, physical scientists and others were statisticians and others were computer scientists, uh, it allowed everybody to work in the same code base from the beginning. So the way that the two language problem often looks when you're working in uh, an environment with you know, people from various backgrounds is that you know, the, the physical scientists will be the ones, or you know, generally the domain experts, will be the ones to do that first prototyping in a high level language. And it's normally only when they're done that they'll then pass the baton off to the computer scientist or HPC specialist who will you know, do that translation to lower level code. And so instead the fact that everybody was working on the same code base from the beginning meant that you know, the team was able to iterate more rapidly and really work together as you know, both the, the science and the implementation of the science evolved together. So with that, um, these are just some, some examples of uh, places where Julia is getting used in, in industry outside. Uh, Celeste was largely a, an academic project, though there were some uh, companies involved. Um, but it's being used both in academia and industry. And we're seeing you know, uptake of the language, especially after the 1.0 release a couple months ago at the end of the summer. And after this tutorial, if you're interested in joining any of our, our online communities, we'd be happy to have you. There are lots of friendly people there, happy to answer questions. And, and I can put this slide up later, too, or, or give you these links. Um, my email there is at the bottom. Um, and yeah, both, both Slack and Discourse are great places to ask general questions. And of course, GitHub, if you have you know, issues to file, um, all different places where you can get involved. Uh, so now we can jump into the tutorial. Um, if you want to run along on Julia Box, uh, you can log in here. Uh, I'm not sure, if, have people tried logging in yet to Julia Box to see if, okay, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so with email, GitHub, Google, or LinkedIn, you'll be able to get in there. Now, once you're on Julia Box, uh, once you're on Julia Box, you'll see a tutorials uh, subdirectory. Let me see if I can pull that up quickly. Um, Okay, so you hit launch once you're in there. So I'm going to be working on a, a local copy for mine, but uh, once you're on Julia Box, uh, you should be able to go into tutorials and then introductory materials. And then inside introductory materials is intro to Julia, which is where I'll be working. Are people able to get onto Julia Box if you're trying? Yeah? Is anybody having any issues? No? Okay. 
All right, so once you are, and did everybody uh, hear where they needed to go once they were uh, logged in? We're all in Intro to Julia. Okay, fantastic. All right, so once you're inside Intro to Julia, uh, we have a series of numbered notebooks. Um, the first notebook is just to show you what it's like to work in a Jupyter notebook. Um, who's familiar with Jupyter notebooks? Many of you use them? Okay, for those of you that haven't, we'll just do a quick rundown. Uh, when we're in this environment, uh, you can add additional cells with this plus sign. And by default, you can write code in any of these cells and then execute that code. So, you know, we could just add, for example, there. Um, by default, uh, whenever you execute a cell, which you can do by hitting run in the arrow with the arrow up there, um, by going to cell and then clicking run cells, for example, or um, by selecting the cell and hitting uh, shift and enter. Uh, so when you run a cell, by default, just the very last line of the cell will print to standard out. Uh, if you want to suppress that output, you can add a semicolon thereafter, and then it looks like nothing happened. Um, and then a couple like Julia environment specific things, both when we're in a Jupyter notebook like this and when we're at the REPL, if we proceed any function call um, with a question mark, we're actually entering the, the help mode that allows us to pull up documentation. So whenever you see a function that you're not familiar with, you can just put a question mark before it um, and then you'll get the docs. And also you can enter shell mode from both a Julia REPL or um, a Jupyter notebook if you're working in a, a Julia kernel. Um, and you can do that by putting a semicolon before any shell command. So if we say semicolon ls, we can see, for example, um, all of the, the documents that are stored in my current folder. Okay, so any questions about navigating this notebook interface? <laughs> Julia Box is slow? Yeah, okay. It, they might be pulling up more nodes. That's sometimes an issue when a couple people sign up. Um, but is it really slow, like loading an open a new yeah, notebook? Or oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and once you have a notebook open, does it run easily through the notebook, or is that also slow? Uh, that seems to be okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, I hope it picks up, and if it doesn't, um, if you, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll demo in so far as I need to, I suppose. Um, okay. Uh, so the first... The notebooks one through six are really meant to be sort of a, a whirlwind tour of Julia syntax. Um, and a lot of it, I think, will look pretty familiar um, if you're you know, coming from a Python background. Um, and then after that, uh, we have some notebooks on you know, showing you how to pull in packages from the Julia ecosystem and uh, a, a speed demo or a benchmarking demo, um, as well as we can talk about linear algebra at the end and the design paradigm if those are of interest, uh, depending on how much time we have. I think we can go pretty quickly through a lot of the syntax um, since it should look familiar, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, so notebook one, getting started. The purpose of this notebook is just to show you how to, uh, how to print in Julia, how to assign variables, how to comment, and what our syntax for basic math looks like. Um, so first off, if you want to print, um, we like to use this println function, uh, which is going to add a, an extra line um, whenever you print. Um, so print line. Uh, and you can throw, you know, for example, strings or, or other variable types inside that function call. Um, when we assign variables in Julia, uh, Julia is dynamic, and so we, we don't need to um, declare you know, the types, um, for example, of our, our variables up front. So I can just say my answer equals 42, and then when I ask Julia with this function type of um, what the type of that uh, variable is, Julia can tell that's an int64. Similarly, we can see that my pi is a float64, and this emoji smiley cat uh, that I assigned to the string smiley cat is a string. Um, 
And if you, if you want to actually create your own emojis or you'll pull up your own emojis, uh, you can use this tab completion where you'll put a backslash and then a colon and then hit tab and be able to select the emoji from there. Um, so SMI should start to trigger the uh, smiley cat. So if you wanted to actually say, hey, I want this particular variable to be an N64, can you go ahead and define that? And then it'll actually check if you do a proper type cast? Um, yeah, you can. And one thing that we'll show at the end of this, for example, like if I, let's just, well, one thing I could do, if I said convert, for example, um, if, I, if I started with something that was, for example, a, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if the integer that I first declared was an in32 or an in64. Um, I could say something like, and then if I were to interrogate what the type of A is, um, yeah. So I, I can convert different types like that. Well, one, one of the things that people grab with uh, Python is, is well, you can't define the, the types ahead of time, and then at runtime you'll get issues when it's trying to, when you're assigning improper types. Mm -hmm. So I'll dig into it. OK. <laughs> Other questions so far? OK. Um, another thing is that you know once we've assigned a value to um, a value of a given type to a variable, we can reassign um, that variable to a different value of a different type without any issue. So smiley cat emoji used to be a string, and here if I assign it to an integer, um, there's no issue. Now smiley cat is an integer, and um, and also programming with emojis is a good example of Julia being generic in general. So here we have. Uh, this smiling emoji and sad emoji equal to zero and negative one, and now we can create Boolean statements from emojis like this, where smiley cat plus brown face turns us into a happy face. Uh, commenting in Julia, uh, just like in Python, we can leave single line comments with uh, a hashtag or a pound sign, and we can create multi line comments by uh, sandwiching our comments inside two pound signs and, uh, and two equal signs. And then the syntax for basic math will look pretty familiar. Um, the only real difference uh, coming from Python is that uh, if you want to exponentiate something, you have to use the caret operator rather than a double star. Okay, so that's it for the first notebook. And then our second notebook is on strings uh, in Julian. So we'll talk about how to create a string, uh, how to interpolate strings, and then how to concatenate them. Um, so first off, to create a string, we have two different ways in Julia, um, both using the double quotation signs. We can either use a single set of double quotation signs or um, a triple set of uh, double quotation marks. Um, one of the differences between these two different types of strings is that I can add a bunch of formatting to the second type, where we have the three sets. And Julia understands then that, you know, I, I, for example, was trying to include these new line characters in my string. Um, another difference is that I can quote inside the second type of string, but not the first. So it's ambiguous where the string actually ends in this first case. But when we have the three sets of double quotation marks defining the beginning and end of the string, we can throw quotation marks inside the string without ambiguity. Um, now, unlike in Python, uh, single quotation marks does not give us a string. Um, so here, the letter A is a char or a character. And if we try to enclose many characters inside single quotation marks, we'll get an error. So we only get one character inside, inside single quotation marks. Um, now to interpolate strings in Julia, um, here I'll create some variables to interpolate. Um, we will throw dollar signs next to the names of the variables that we want to include in our string. Um, so here I'm throwing the variable name um, by dollar sign name and here uh, num fingers is preceded by dollar sign and num toes is preceded by a dollar sign. Um, in this example here, we see that we can uh, interpolate expressions that will get evaluated and then thrown inside the string. So here we're adding 10 and 10 together to interpolate the number 20. So there we just throw parentheses out around the expression that we want to interpolate and then the dollar sign goes outside that, that pair of parentheses. Um, and we also have a few different ways we can do string concatenation. Did you have a question or? No, no? okay, just checking. Um, all right, so string concatenation. So here I have these two 
uh, short strings, S3 and S4. And then we have the smiley cat emoji assigned to the number 10 there. Um, so if I wanted to concatenate the strings S3 and S4 together, I could use this string function. Um, and string takes arbitrary numbers of inputs, and the inputs don't have to be you know, just other strings. They can be whatever you like, really. Um, so if I call string here on three inputs now, I get a response to my first uh, concatenated string, how many cats is too many cats, which is, I don't know, but 10 is too few. Um, and we could have concatenated those strings S3 and S4 together um, instead using the star operator. So this is another difference with, um, with Python. We can't add, uh, we can't add two strings together with the, the plus operator. Uh, we have to use star. And uh, the reason for that, this is a, a commonly asked question, uh, is that um, you know, addition by definition is, is you know, commutative. And uh, when we're adding our strings together, we don't intend to be commutative, whereas multiplication in general is not commutative. When you think about like matrices being multiplied by vectors and that sort of thing. So that was sort of the design philosophy that went into the, the multiplication operator um, being something that allows you to concatenate rather than the uh, addition operator. Uh, and when you exponentiate things in Julia, uh, the, the star operator is what's really getting called under the hood. Um, and so because the star operator allows us to concatenate strings, if I were to exponentiate a string, I will get large, or I can get large repetition of the string that way. Are there any questions on the string intro? Uh, yeah, like if I just said times 10 like this. Yeah, yeah so that one um, doesn't have a method defined. But if you wanted it to do something, you could define a method for yourself. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So the third notebook then is on data structures. And we can talk through. Um, what making tuples, dictionaries, and arrays look like in Julia. Um, so first off, tuples look just the same as they do in, in Python. Um, we enclose our, um, our data that we want to enclose in a tuple inside uh, parentheses. So here we're creating this tuple called My Favorite Animals. Um, first thing to, to note here is that Julia is one indexed rather than zero indexed. So when I ask for the first element of this tuple, I'm getting penguins rather than cats. And, uh, and because tuples are immutable and we can't update them, uh, penguins will forever be that, that first element in our tuple. We can't update to, to otters. Uh, as of Julia 1.0, we now have uh, something called named tuples in the base language. Um, so the idea of a named tuple is that we can um, assign variables within the tuple to the elements of that tuple. So for example, I could say, you know, within this tuple, my favorite animals that I'm creating, uh, I'm going to have some field assigned to a bird variable, some field assigned to um, a mammal, and another to you know, a marsupial. Um, so when I create this version of my favorite animals, um, I can still index in to grab that first element, which is penguins. Um, or I could grab penguins by saying, like, what is the bird, uh, the bird variable inside of that. So, out of curiosity, I know that named tuples are just added in Python 3.7, if I remember correctly. Okay. What are they useful for other than having immutable key value pairs? Or is that the use case? Like, when everyone use them? I'm actually, I'm not sure what the use case is. Um, so I guess. I oh, yeah. The, the answer to this one. So, dictionaries <laughs> are the other version of this thing, but oh. dictionaries are actually relatively large object in memory. Mm -hmm. And named tuples, because they're immutable, are, are actually much smaller yeah, in their footprint. Um, and they're actually all been available in the collections mm -hmm. module for quite some time, um, if you're using an old version of Python. There's also something called a record type, which if you want a mutable version of the named tuple, that's still less memory footprint than a dictionary. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to create a dictionary in Julia, we can use this, uh, this dict function call, um, so capital D-I-C-T. 
Uh, and we can just call that with empty parentheses following it. Or we can initialize our dictionary to have key value pairs at the start. And if we want to initialize it with key value pairs, uh, we use the syntax that's shown here, where we'll, we'll type out our first key and then create an arrow with an equal sign and a right pointing arrowhead, and then the name of the value associated with that key. Um, so for example, we can create a dictionary like my phone book here, where we're calling dict and then adding uh, values that are phone numbers stored as strings associated with names that are stored as strings. Um, so now if we wanted to perform a, a lookup uh, in a dictionary like this, uh, we can put the name of the dictionary followed by square brackets and then, uh, and then the, the key in there. Um, and adding additional entries to our existing dictionary, um, we can do just like this, where we're using that same indexing syntax on the left and then an equal sign and the new value on the right. Um, to check that that worked, if we call my phone book, we see that we're up to three entries now. Uh, we can use this function called pop bang if we want to remove an existing entry from a dictionary. And so what we did here is that we called uh, pop bang, so pop with an exclamation point following it, on the name of the dictionary and then the key from the key value pair that we want to remove. So that returns um, the value and, uh, and then we can see that Kramer's been deleted from my phone book. Um, we can't index into dictionaries just like, just like in Python. You can't index into, uh, no, okay, all right, just checking. I forgot that one. Um, and so if we, if we try to you know, throw a one inside square brackets for a lookup, Julia thinks that we're looking for some key called one, and that's why we're getting a method, uh, or it's a key error there. And finally, uh, to make arrays, uh, the syntax we use looks like making a list in Python. Um, so we're closing our elements now inside square brackets. And uh, one of the things that we see here when we create this array, um, this you know, sort of signature that we're getting back says that we have created something that has five elements. And it's telling us that this is an array uh, that is 1D, where the elements of that 1D array are strings. Uh, similarly, if we were to create, for example, this array called Fibonacci, um, we can see that this is a 1D array that contains in 64s. Uh, but there's no issue with creating arrays that have many types um, inside of them. So here, this array called mixture, um, it's a 1D array that now takes elements of the any type. Um, where if you were to look at the type hierarchy for, for Julia, um, any is an abstract type that encompasses all other types um, within the language. Uh, so if we want to you know, index into an array and grab elements, it looks just like in Python. So here we're grabbing the third element of my friends. Uh, here we're updating that uh, third element to baby bop. And otherwise we can edit or update an array using the push bang and the pop bang functions just the way that you would in Python. Um, except that here we have these exclamation points at the end. And we'll talk about in a later notebook why we have exclamation points there. But um, for now, push bang would throw 21 onto the end of the array called Fibonacci and pop bang would return whatever's at the end. Uh, so there it's removing the 21 and taking us back down to that seven element array there. Questions so far? Yes? Um, in Python, a dictionary it has a slower response to a lookup than a, um, than a tuple would. Um, do you know how that is in, in Julia? I imagine it's slower since they're not stack allocated. But, well, I actually don't even know if that's a good, I, I'm not sure. Oh, I, I thought that they were slower, but I'm not sure. conversation between earlier that got me thinking about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So all of the examples I've given so far have been of, um, you know, 1D uh, data structures, or rather arrays of, um, sorry, not just arrays, but Generally, I've shown data structures that have contained scalars as their, their values. Um, but you know, we can create data structures of other data structures. So for example, I could create an array of arrays. Um, here I've created an array of an array of strings. Um, and that's what this is saying here. It looks a little cryptic at first. Um, but we, we have a difference. Um, in Julia, there's a difference between a 1D array that contains other 1D arrays um, that's not the same as a 2D array that would be like a matrix. So vectors of vectors are separate from matrices. Um, and I just used a bunch of different terms at once. But um, in, in Julia, a 1D array is also called a vector. A 2D array is also called a matrix. 
Um, and so here, what this is telling us is that we have a 1D array, where now the elements of this 1D array are other 1D arrays that contain strings. Um, or we could say it's a vector of vector of strings. Uh, here, numbers, if we look at this part here, uh, this is again saying that we have a 1D array that contains 1D arrays of integers, or it's a vector of vector of integers. Uh, one function that generates um, multi-dimensional arrays is this rand function, uh, where by default rand is uh, generating an array that has the dimensions of the arguments that are passed to it. So if we say rand of 4 and 3, we're getting a 4 by 3 array. Um, and then it randomly populates that array that it creates with numbers between 0 and 1. And so we can see here that the dimensionality of this array that we just created is 2. So we have a 2D array of floats. Um, and here we have a, a 3D array of floats. Uh, and the last thing to, to say about arrays here is just to be careful when you're trying to copy them. So um, you know, if, if you, for example, started with this array called Fibonacci that we've already seen, and then you tried to copy it by simply adding, um, or rather assigning uh, the array some numbers to it, uh, what you'll see is that if you were to you know, update uh, the array called some numbers by indexing into it and then uh, check out Fibonacci thereafter. Fibonacci has also been updated because all we did was give a second name to an existing data structure. So you need to use the copy function or the deep copy function if you want to actually copy an array where deep copy performs recursive copies. Um, and that's what I show here. I restore Fibonacci to its original state. I copy Fibonacci to get this new array called some more numbers. And then you know, when you perform updates on some more numbers, uh, Fibonacci remains untouched. So any questions on Julia data structures? No? Okay, great. So we're, we're halfway through the, the whirlwind syntax tour. Okay, so while in for loops in Julia, um, these will look very familiar. The, the big differences that you'll see or our, our while loop syntax is that we have an end keyword uh, to delineate when our, when our control flow ends. Uh, we don't need a colon after the while statement. And uh, it also doesn't really matter, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of white space you use to indent. So here I've, I've used about four spaces, I think, but if I wanted to add you know, arbitrary numbers of spaces, um, this while loop where I'm counting to 10 would work just the same way. Uh, and then a for loop is going to look pretty similar, where again, uh, now we have our for keyword, our in keyword, we have an end keyword, just as with a while loop, no colon after the line with the for. Um, and another thing to note here is I'm, I'm using a range in Julia to, to count from 1 to 10 inside this for loop. Um, so ranges we can create in Julia by specifying the beginning of the range, uh, a colon, then the end of a range. And if I want to add a step, I would add that in between the beginning and the end with, again, colons to separate each of those, those numbers. Um, so there I would get you know, printing all of the odd numbers in my for loop. Um, and just as you, know, you could do in Python, we could, uh, we could iterate over collections um, generally. Um, so arrays or, or ranges or, or, or what, whatever you might like. Um, so the next part, I wanted to show a couple different ways um, to do something, to show you some syntactic sugar in Julia. So the something that we're going to do is to create an addition table, where that addition table is a matrix, uh, where the entry of every matrix is going to be the sum of the row and the column indices um, of that element. So we'll start by um, initializing or creating a matrix of zeros. Um, and to do that, I'm using this fill command in Julia, where the fill command takes as the first input um, whatever you want to fill the array that you're creating with. And then as the second input, you can pass a tuple that specifies the dimensions of the array that you're creating and filling. So we have now this matrix of zeros called A. Um, and if we wanted to create our addition table, we could do that by creating a, a nested for loop that looks like this, where we uh, iterate over all the rows, all of the columns, and then we're indexing into uh, our multidimensional array A there and updating each of its entries. Um, now, if we wanted to, we could use um, some syntactic sugar where we condense our for loops um, onto the same line and only use you know, one for keyword and one end keyword here. Um, so what that looks like 
is shown here. And now I'm creating a matrix B. Um, so we'll do the same thing to B that we did to A with this condensed for loop syntax, where now you can see that we're taking I from 1 to M and J from 1 to N on the same line. And we just have a comma there to separate the two different iterators. Um, so we get the same result in the end. Uh, and the third way that we might have done this is by doing an array comprehension, which looks just like a list comprehension. Um, so an array comprehension in Julia would look like this, uh, where we've basically taken what was the first line there. What I have highlighted is the first line of this condensed for loop here. Um, and then uh, we've pasted inside of our square brackets. Um, and to the left of our for statement, uh, we have effectively our loop body, or what we want to populate the entries of the array that we're creating with. Um, are, are list comprehensions familiar to people here? Or, mm -hmm. yeah, OK. All right. And, and just in case there's anyone that maybe hasn't seen uh, list or array comprehensions before, the idea is that um, in 1D, for example, I could do something like x for x in um, 1 to 10, and then I'm basically looping over all of the, uh, the indices of the array that I want to create. Um, so in 1D, this is what an array comprehension would look like. Does that work for lambdas as well? Do you guys, I'm sorry, does it work for what? Uh, lambda expressions? Or does Julia support lambda expressions? It does, yeah. We can, we can declare anonymous functions. Okay, cool. Yeah. Questions on, on loops so far? No? Okay. All right. Notebook five then uh, is on conditional statements in Julia. Um, so in Julia, we have our, our if and our else keywords. Um, instead of elif, we have else if. And we, we end our uh, conditional statements with an end. Um, so the first example that I have here of actually you know, implementing uh, some sort of conditional is uh, my implementation of the, the FizzBuzz test in Julia. Has anybody heard of FizzBuzz before? Or? OK, so some of you have. The idea of the FizzBuzz test is that you, know, you might, uh, in going in for a programming interview, be given a question where you, you're given a number or a set of numbers. And uh, if the number is divisible by 3, you want to print Fizz. If it's divisible by 5, uh, you want to print buzz, and if it's divisible by both fizz or by both three and five, uh, then you want to print fizz buzz. Um, and so here I'll I like the number 42. So n is 42, um, and then what we're doing here is checking for divis divisibility by both three and five, and I'm doing that with this double ampersand um, to say and. Um, alternatively, I could have just said a single ampersand, but I'll I'll talk to you about the difference at the end of this notebook. Um, but yeah, a single ampersand will say and. Um, I'm using this double equal sign to check equality, and then we have the modulo operator. And, and otherwise, our if, else, if, uh, and else, and end keywords. So if we do that, we get fizz. Uh, ternary operators are, are another way to express conditionals in Julia that uh, I had never seen as a, as a Python user. So I think they're kind of <coughs> cool. Um, the idea is that if you, if you have a conditional statement that is basically if A, B, else C, end, uh, you could rewrite that conditional statement to be A question mark B colon C. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you now what I mean by that. Um, so we could have, say, say we have two numbers X and Y, and I'll assign them to 3 and 4. And if uh, we want to return the larger of the two numbers, we might write a conditional statement like this, where we, see if, where we say if x is greater than y, x else y. Um, and we could rewrite this conditional statement using a ternary operator, um, as I've done right here. So now we have our conditional statement uh, just copied from up here. And then we throw a question mark after that. And then whatever would normally come uh, if that's true followed by a colon, and then whatever would come if that's false. And what comes you know, after the colon could be another such ternary operator. You could sort of string them together and create something kind of horrifying uh, or exciting, depending on your perspective. 
the final thing that I wanted to talk about when we're talking about conditional evaluation is uh, short circuit evaluation in Julia. Um, and so the idea is that in Julia, if, if we by default just say, I'm going to add an extra cell here. Um, but if I, if I just say, um, I'll say false and true, for example, um, this is going to return false. Um, but if I've used just a single ampersand to ask if both false and true are true, um, then what will happen is that Julia will eagerly evaluate this expression, or rather Julia will look at this second argument to see if it's true or false, even after it's already hit the false, or even after it's already seen enough to know that the final answer should be, should be false. Um, similarly, if we were, if we were short-circuiting and saying, you know, uh, true or, is how, uh, sorry, vertical line is how we say or in Julia. So if I said true or false, um, the answer should be true. Um, and we'll get that, but we're actually going to spend the time looking at false after, after seeing the first true. Um, so if you want to short circuit that process and only look at you know, the minimum amount of information that you need to evaluate an expression, uh, you can short circuit by doubling your ampersand or doubling your, um, your vertical line. And so you'll get the same output in both of these cases, but um, if you get to the point where you know a statement is already going to be true or false, you can just stop checking and evaluating at that point. When wouldn't you want to <laughs> short circuit it? When would you not want to? Um, for, I know for bitwise operations, this is the, the default. The default behavior is to not short circuit. Um, yeah. That's, I, I, and I, I don't really understand, honestly. Um, yeah. I don't know much about, yeah, bitwise operations. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not helpful. That's, that's the default answer I've, I've always been given, and I've never dug enough to understand. Because this seems like a good thing. It does, yeah. It's more efficient. Other questions so far? Sure. Okay. Um, and just to give you, in case it wasn't um, fully clear, to give you an example of where behavior, we can actually see behavior being different. Um, in these statements, we have um, two short circuiting statements, one with false and uh, print high, um, and then the second is true and print high, and we only actually get to the point where we print high in the second example, um, because here we, we terminate our evaluation after we see this first false. So yeah, and similarly here, if we, if we short circuit with or, um, we only actually print the high in the, in the second case where we're still looking for a true va a value. Okay. So our last notebook on syntax is notebook six, uh, which is on declaring functions in Julia. So in this notebook, we'll talk about um, how to declare a function. Um, we'll talk about duct typing in Julia, and then uh, mutating versus non-mutating functions. And uh, we'll discuss a couple higher order functions at the end. And I'll define what a higher order function is, if that's a, a foreign term. Uh, so first off, declaring a function. There are a few different ways that we can declare a function in Julia. Uh, the first is to use the, the function keyword um, and the end keyword to delineate when we're at the end of the function. Um, we put the function name and the function arguments on the same line as the function keyword, just like if we were using def in Python. Um, again, we don't need any colon to, to say on, on the same line as the function keyword. And we can put our function body um, between the function and the end, or the lines with the function and the end keywords. Um, one thing that you'll notice here is that, you know, in this function f, for example, where I'm squaring, um, in, in both of them really, I don't have any return statement. Um, Julia, by default, is going to return whatever is on the last line of the function. And I can choose to explicitly say return if I want to, um, and it, it won't change anything about the way the function is implemented under the hood. Um, that's just a, a syntactic choice that I can make as the programmer. Uh, we can call either of those functions just like you would in Python. So here we're, we're greeting C3PO and squaring 42. Um, and now we could have written either of these functions with different syntax using neither the function nor the, the end keyword if we had just written the function name, uh, the function input arguments, and then follow that with an equal sign followed by the function body on the right. 
Um, so there's our, our second version of say hi and our second version of f. Um, and calling functions written in this way uh, is exactly the same as calling them when they're declared in the first way. And the final way that we might have declared uh, either of these functions is by writing them as anonymous functions. Um, so if you're not familiar with anonymous or lambda functions, um, the idea is that you know, we could have a function that literally has no name. And so, for example, if I, if I declare this, um, I've now declared a lambda function um, where it is uh, taking whatever the input arguments are on the, the leftmost side um, and then sort of mapping them to my function body on the right where we have an arrow to separate the input arguments and the, uh, the function body. Um, but of course, if we define a function in this way without giving it any name, there's no way to access it after we've created it. And so we do have the option, if, if you like this syntax, but you want to be able to reference your function thereafter, you can bind a variable to your anonymous function like this. Um, so here I'm binding the variable f3 to this function that takes x and squares it. Um, and then calling either of these anonymous functions uh, looks the same, or we have the same syntax for calling them as we would for functions declared by the either of the two other two methods. So if you did f3 of i, going back to your previous example, you see you get i i. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that kind of brings us into the, <laughs> that's actually one of my examples when we're talking about duct typing in Julia, that, uh, you know, previously we were using um, uh, strings as, as inputs to say hi, for example. Um, but because, you know, we're just doing string interpolation under the hood with the function say hi, we can interpolate a number just as easily as another string. Um, and then the function f, you know, we haven't declared to work on any particular type, but it'll work now for any inputs um, for which it's possible to multiply things together. Um, so if we had a matrix A, for example, and call f on A, we're going to get matrix matrix multiplication uh, under the hood because that's a, a well-defined operation for the, one of the well-defined methods for the, the, um, the star operator. And then here's my original f on high. Um, however, where, where this won't work, um, where the functions I've declared so far won't work is where there aren't underlying methods to support the types that I'm passing to that function. So um, for example, if I had a vector um, v, which just here has three elements. Um, if I pass uh, v to my function f, which squares things, uh, the reason that we get a method error there is that there is no way to, to square a vector in Julia. There's, there's no associated method with the idea of multiplying a vector by another vector um, because it's, it's not clear what you would want if you, if you asked for that. It's not clear if you want, you know, for example, an inner product or an outer product. Um, or just element-wise multiplication. Um, and so Julia doesn't take a guess. Julia instead just uh, gives you this message. So earlier, I, I called a couple functions that had exclamation points at the end. Um, the reason for those exclamation points is to denote whether or not a function is a mutating <coughs> function. Um, so a mutating function is a function that uh, will alter some of the inputs that you've passed to it. And, uh, and by convention in Julia, when we have a mutating function, we'll follow the name of that function by an exclamation point. Um, but that is just a convention. So you could write a, your own function without you know, thinking about whether it's mutating or, or non-mutating. And, and nobody's forcing you to add the exclamation point. But if you're using on, uh, a function that is uh, coming as part of you know, the base language or you know, part of the broader Julia ecosystem, you can normally trust that uh, well, in the base language, you can certainly trust that uh, if something has an exclamation point, it's mutating. And if it doesn't, it's not. Um, and so an example of, of mutating versus non-mutating behavior, um, I'll show here with this sort function. So now we have a new vector v that has the numbers 3, 5, and 2. If we call the sort function on v, we get this sorted vector. Um, but if we look at the vector v itself after calling sort, um, it's, it's unchanged. We didn't actually sort it. If we had instead called sort bang on v, we get that same output of a sorted vector, but now v itself is also the sorted vector. Um, and so examples where I used mutating functions prior to this notebook were when I was calling pop bang and push bang, and I was calling those on arrays that I was editing in place. Either adding an element or taking one away. Questions on that so far? 
Um, so the idea of a higher order function, for those of you that may not have heard that term before, um, a higher order function is just a function that will take other functions as input arguments. Um, and so a classic example of a higher order function um, is the map function, um, where, and I, I'm not, is the syntax for map exactly the same in Python? I, uh, maybe I should show the syntax before I ask that. Um, the syntax for, for map in Julia is that the first input to map will be a function. Um, and then subsequent input arguments to map will be collections um, over which you will apply that function element wise. And so if I call map on the function f and then the vector that contains the numbers 1, 2, and 3, the return that I get um, is an array that contains uh, the, the values of that array, 1, 2, and 3, with the function f applied to each of them. Um, so that's what we see here. I'll just, I'm squaring each of the entries in that, in that vector. Um, and so, is anybody here familiar with map in Python? Is it exactly the same or, yeah? Okay. Um, and higher order functions is one place where we can actually make use of lambda functions or anonymous functions uh, without binding variables to them to be able to call them afterwards. So if we pass a, a lambda or an anonymous function as the first input to map here, uh, it works just as well as a function that we you know, might have declared outside of the function call um, to map. So there we're just cubing the entries of, of that vector one, two, and three. Um, now another high order function in, in Julia is the broadcast function, which is sort of a generalization of map. So it, it's able to handle certain use cases that map cannot. Um, for the purpose of this tutorial, we can, we can just treat broadcast for now like it is um, a clone of map with a different name. Um, so if we were to call broadcast on f and then this vector 1, 2, 3, we again are just getting element-wise squaring. Um, but one of the things that's cool about broadcast is that um, we, can, we can call broadcast under the hood without explicitly saying broadcast by simply adding a dot after any function name um, in a function call. So if I say f dot to the vector 1, 2, 3, we again see that element-wise squaring. And to kind of drive home that point, um, if I had a matrix A, for example, that has the integers 1 to 9 from the upper left to the lower right-hand corner, if I call the function f on A, which is again just our squaring function, I'm going to get the product of the matrix A times the matrix A. Um, but if I call f dot on A, I'm actually broadcasting the square function element-wise over the entries of that, that matrix A. And one of the things that is good about the, the dot syntax is that it gives you what uh, what I think is a more natural expression of the mathematics that you might write down on paper. So rather than you know, explicitly needing to say broadcast, writing out some lambda function, for example, and then you know, applying that more you know, composed or complicated um, function to some input array, um, we can just add dots associated with each of our function calls and, and uh, and get the same result. Also, uh, broadcast will fuse your operations. So um, if, we, if we call broadcast um, in either of these ways, uh, we don't get temporary allocation of, of variables as we you know, perform one operation at a time. Uh, we don't need to, you know, for example, call f on a and store the result of that somewhere temporarily before we can divide all the elements by, by the entries of a. Any questions on this stuff so far? So what's the order of precedence on that statement? Um, so is it going to do it just in order? Or is it going to do the two times? Um, the order of precedence will follow whatever the like mathematical order of precedence is. Um, and so, and if I remember correctly, normally addition and multiplication reign over, multiplication um, or sorry, multiplication yeah. division reign over uh, addition and subtraction, yeah. Question. Yeah, um, what broadcast does that map cannot do is that it can work with uh, data structures that don't have the same uh, dimensions. 
So for example, you could, um, you could add together, with broadcast you could add together a matrix and uh, a number or a matrix and a vector. Um, say for example that you had a two by two matrix and a two by two vector, you could, yeah, you could add the vector so that it was um, applied like as if you had added it to each of the rows of the matrix rather than, uh, yeah. So uh, another way to say that is that um, if you add together two objects um, with broadcast, one of which has a singleton dimension, um, the other dimension, it, that singleton dimension is expanded um, to, to match the dimensionality of your other object. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so that was our syntax tour. Um, notebook, notebook seven is where we just see how to use packages in the Julia ecosystem. And, uh, and eight is plotting, which we can go through pretty quickly. Um, and I definitely wanna get through notebook nine. So I think uh, getting through seven through nine will be really easy with the time we have remaining. And then after that, we can talk about uh, whether you wanna see some linear algebra or talk a little bit about the design paradigm. Does that sound good? Yeah, okay, cool. So notebook seven. All right, um, so the Julia ecosystem is, uh, is quickly growing. We have over 2,000 registered packages now, and one of the, the I guess, design objectives um, since the beginning of Julia has been to really provide first-class interfaces to other languages um, and you know, external packages um, so that you know, if you were coming to Julia as the user of another language like Python or R, um, you wouldn't have to worry about you know, not having access to some of your favorite functionality in that other language as the Julia ecosystem was growing. And so for that reason, we have packages, for example, like you know, PyCall and RCall that will allow you to call any, um, any uh, functions from within like the base Python or, or R languages. Um, also, we'll see in an upcoming notebook that you can, for example, declare and compile code in C um, from within Jupyter Notebook or generally from within a Julia environment. Um, and if you're interested in seeing other you know, available packages that are out there, uh, we have all of our, our packages tracked on pkg.julialang.org as well as juliaobserver.com. Um, but rather than trying to give you an overview of the whole ecosystem, the point of this is really just to show you how to, to load and install uh, an external package. Um, and so how you would do that is that you would start by uh, saying that you're using pkg, where pkg is our package manager. Um, and so if I, if I were to say I'm using pkg and um, maybe I want to install uh, a package called example, um, I would do that like this. Um, and that should be pretty fast today because I've already installed it previously. Also example is a very small package. Um, but these are the sorts of notifications you would get as a package installs. Um, if you are on Julia Box and it's working right now, um, all of our packages are pre-installed so that you wouldn't have to do this. Um, now when you are working in your own local Julia installation, uh, you only need to install a package once for a given Julia binary and thereafter you can simply load the package without installing it. And how you would load a package um, is by saying that you're, you're using uh, the example package, for example, um, in your current environment. Um, so now I've loaded example and the example package uh, has its source code stored on GitHub at this link um, under the uh, example.jl file. And if you were to go to that link, you would see that the source code includes uh, this, this function declaration for hello, which takes a string and then greets the string that you've passed as an input argument. Um, so now that I've, I've run using example, um, I have access to that hello function and so I can print uh, some Adele lyrics with it, for example. Um, another package that I like to, to demo using is the colors package. And so we don't have to install today, so we don't have to run pkg.add. Um, all we have to do is say that we're using colors. Um, and once we've, we've started using the colors package, uh, we have access to this function called distinguishable colors, which will give us as many, um, as many distinguishable colors as we ask for. So here we're getting a palette of 100 different colors. Uh, one thing that's kind of fun to do with this palette is that, um, here I'll add some extra cells. So we've seen this rand command before, uh, where the rand command, uh, if I pass it the numbers three and three, I'm going to get this randomly populated three by three matrix that has floating point numbers. Um, 
Now, if I want to randomly populate a matrix with elements of other collections, I can specify a collection as the first input argument. So I could say, for example, populate my 3x3 three three matrix with some number from the range 1 to 10, and now I'm getting a matrix of integers. Um, now, if I wanted to pass any type of collection, this will still work. So if I, if I pass the palette as my input collection, I get a randomly checkered matrix. Um, and I just like this example because I can keep running it, and I always get something different. It's very visual. Get to see the randomness better. So that's it for packages. Um, I have this notebook on plotting next. So you said for Python, you could, stand, uh, you could call any, anything as part of the standard distribution, even if it's part of something in that uh, pandas, as an example. Yeah. Um, I know that. Often individual packages from other ecosystems will get wrapped separately, so then there will be other Julia packages. Um, rather than using PyCall to call a Python function, you could um, call, I'm trying to think of an example. Like we have, uh, I'll use in, in uh, an upcoming notebook, um, there's a conda package that allows you to call NumPy, for example. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the exact coverage of the Python ecosystem is within wrapping, but yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure, for example, if you can call pandas. I'd be kind of surprised if you couldn't, but but I'm not there, certain. There is, okay. Pass, yeah. there is, okay. So then you use that then to invoke anything from pandas. You're not, help, you're not doing PyCall. Right, yeah. PyCall was just an example of a way that you would interface with, with a Python yeah, function. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to rerun this notebook. I'll run the whole thing at once. Um, the plotting story in Julia is still coming along. For the most part in Julia, we mostly plot using other languages plotting libraries. Um, you can even plot with PyPlot from within Julia. Um, the plotting package that I'll show today is this one called plots or plots.jl. Um, and what's cool about plots is that it gives you one common set of syntax from which you can call multiple different backends, like PyPlot or Unicode Plots or GR or Plotly.js. Um, and so thereby you can, you can write some code to generate a plot, and then thereafter you can decide you want to use some other backend, and you only have to change one line of code. You don't have to switch out syntax. Um, and so to demo that, what we'll be plotting today um, is this data that I data thieved offline. Um, where we have uh, global temperatures for several years between the 1860s and the year 2000. Um, global temperatures in, in degrees Celsius. Um, and then the numbers of, of pirates in the world uh, at the corresponding years in the next array. Um, and then I'm calling here the GR backend. Um, you would have to go to the plots.jl documentation to see which backends are supported. Um, but here I'm calling the GR backend so we can start plotting with GR. And zoom out a little. So I can start creating a plot of my, uh, my temperatures and my pirate populations using this plot command up here, uh, where we have you know, my, my independent <laughs> and my possibly dependent data. Um, no, here, um, yeah, whatever's on the, the horizontal and the vertical axes. Um, so we have this call to plot uh, first, and then a call to scatter bang. And the reason that there's an exclamation point there following, following the call to scatter um, is that this is actually a mutating call where we're going to be mutating the plot that we create with the plot call so that we can create an overlay. Um, what you would see is that if we instead were to delete this exclamation point um, and run the code, we would get two separate plots, uh, one with a, a line plot and one with a scatter plot. Um, so this is our overlay. Uh, one of the first things that we can do is annotate our plot with these other mutating functions, x label bang, y label bang, and title bang, which are giving us our, our axes labels and our title. Um, and here I, I just like correlation versus causation jokes. Um, so this is our, our pirate populations on, on global warming effect. Uh, one of the things that looks kind of weird about this plot when you first glance at it, at it is that we see that temperatures are going down as well as um, pirate populations increasing. And the reason is that the third variable here is time. Um, and then Julia by default is 
uh, plotting whatever I have on the horizontal axis in increasing order from left to right. Um, but the data that we have is actually fire populations are going down over time, as you, as you might guess. And uh, global temperatures have been rising. And so we actually kind of need to mirror flip uh, this plot in order to, to look forward in time rather than backwards. Uh, and we can do that with this x flip bang command here. Um, so now we're looking forward in time from left to right. Uh, and we can see that we, we might do better with more pirates. <laughs> Um, now, if you wanted to use a, a different backend, uh, we could call pyplot, for example, and then with the same code, just copied and pasted, um, we get a very similar looking plot. Um, earlier, we can also, if I uncomment this, there's this other backend called Unicode plots, which gives you a pretty different interface, but it looks like the, um, oh, I think I need to zoom out there. Yeah, so that's what Unicode plots would look like. Um, I think it's more fun at the, at the REPL, to, or the terminal rather, to, to use Unicode plots. Um, but it looked, I, I realized this earlier, it looks like XFlip bang doesn't work in Unicode plots for some reason. So, um, yeah. And then the point of the exercises that I have at the bottom of this notebook were really just to show you how to do subplots uh, in Julia. And, and what I'm doing here, I'll zoom back in, um, is that I create four plots that I've bound to variables, P1, P2, P3, and P4. And then I have this fifth call to plot where I pass the names of those plots as input arguments. Um, and then I use this layout keyword to specify my layout. And, and I could change that to, in this case, a four by one or one by four or what have you. Questions on plotting? Oop, OK. All right. So this notebook is one that I'll run all for two to get through it more quickly. Um, this is the, the benchmarking notebook that I mentioned at the, at the beginning when I was doing my intro slides. And so the idea is that we're going to look at different implementations of, again, this sum function uh, that adds together all the elements of a vector. And we're going to look at implementations uh, in C, Python, and Julia, where in particular we're going to start with just a, a handwritten version um, of the sum function in C. Then we'll optimize a little by using the, the dash fast math flag. Uh, then we'll look at a built-in, um, or sorry, a built-in version of uh, the sum function in Python, a built-in version from NumPy, and then our handwritten in Python. Uh, and then we'll look at three different versions in Julia too, where we have the, the built-in in Julia, our handwritten in Julia, and then our handwritten where we've thrown in some uh, single instruction, multiple data. Um, now again, for the purpose of benchmarking, uh, we're going to use a 10 million element vector. And so we generate that vector with the rand command, uh, and we're assigning that to a vector called A. And one of the first things that we do after creating this vector is just a sanity check to make sure that our built-in version of sum in Julia is working the way we might expect. So if we call sum on A, um, we have you know, roughly 0.5 as our, our average element here, um, times 10 million, and we're getting about 5 million as our sum. Um, so that seems to be working as, as you might expect. Um, now, for the purpose of benchmarking in Julia, um, we could use this at time macro if we wanted to, where at time is just going to return uh, the time that it takes to run the, the piece of code that, that follows it. Um, so one of the issues with the at time macro is that it's not um, it doesn't give you super precise results because there might be other things going on in your system and you just have you know, one sampling point for how, how fast something is. Um, so here we can see some, some wide variation in how long sum takes to run uh, when we call at time uh, on, on different occasions. Um, and so a better way to benchmark rather than using this at time macro is to use functions from within this benchmark tools package. Um, and so what benchmark tools does um, is that it will run many samples of a given, uh, or it'll, it'll run a piece of code that you're trying to time um, many times, and it will gather as many, as many samples or as many statistics as it needs um, before um, it sort of converges on, on some average. I'm not sure exactly what the heuristics for that are, um, but you'll see when you run benchmark tools that the number of samples it takes will, will change every time with, with different pieces of code. Um, and so 
I'll demo that first on our, um, our, our handwritten C implementation of some. Um, so in this block of code, and I didn't, I didn't draft this initial notebook, I know very little C, um, but we have our, our C code here enclosed within a string. Um, and then down here is where we're actually compiling uh, our C code and ultimately declaring within our, um, our Julia scope this function called csum that's going to be calling C code under the hood. And here you can see that we're using this C call um, command to, to grab the C function that we actually generated when we compiled in this line. So there's a little bit of black magic going on in, in this call or in this function um, block. But, uh, but yeah, if we call csum here, we get about 5 million. More precisely, if we want to check that the output of csum is about the same of what we would get from the Julia built-in sum, um, we can use this, this set of curly equal signs, which under the hood is calling um, the is approximate or is approx function, um, which tells you if two numbers are the same within some tolerance. Um, also, we could, you know, if we take the difference, we can see that there's a very small difference between the two outputs. Um, so the idea is that every time we, we look at a different implementation, we'll do some sanity checks, and then we'll actually do the benchmarking. So when we benchmark uh, this implementation of csum here with the at benchmark command, uh, we get some, some different you know, um, statistics on the speed. So we see uh, that there were 432 samples taken when we ran this, and that uh, the minimum runtime is reported as well as the maximum runtime, and then two average runtimes, the median and the mean. Uh, we also get to see what sort of memory was used, which isn't super interesting here, but might be more interesting if you're benchmarking something else. Um, so here, our minimum runtime is about 11.4 milliseconds. Um, and so we're going to grab that minimum of, of our output times here and add it to this dictionary called D that we're creating in the line above what I've highlighted there um, so that we can keep track of how well each of the implementations do as we go. Um, and one final thing in this section is that we, uh, we have a plot here of um, a histogram of, of, of the run times um, for, for this C implementations of, of some, uh, just so you can get a sense of you know, why it takes so many samples or you know, what kind of variance you might expect to see um, in, in running a piece of code. So here we have you know, calls taking anywhere from you know, maybe 11.35 to 11.66 <coughs> or something milliseconds. Um, okay, so, so now if we were to add the, the fast math flag um, to our C compilation, um, we, we can declare a new function within our scope called C sum fast math. And if we benchmark that as we did above, we see that we went down from just over 11 milliseconds to just over 4 milliseconds. So that was a, a pretty huge optimization. Um, and then we can add this best case runtime here again to this output dictionary D. Uh, so after looking at our two C implementations, one that's unoptimized and one that is a bit optimized, uh, we can move to the, the built-in version of sum in Python, uh, which we can bring in uh, to our scope using the, the pi call package, um, which gives us this function pi built in. Um, now if I call pi sum, we can see that our sanity checks are working. And if we benchmark pi sum here, it's taking uh, over 700 milliseconds to, to do that addition. Uh, if we add that to our, our minimum, or we add the minimum there um, to our output dictionary, we can then move to our NumPy version of Python, which is going to be considerably faster. And we'll, we'll pull that in um, with, uh, with the conda package um, and then import some from, our, from the NumPy um, package. And if we benchmark our NumPy version of some here, we're, we're down to an you know, order of four milliseconds. Um, and yeah, the uh, benchmark tools is fantastic, and it, it really you know, uh, decreases the error <laughs> bars on, on your measurements. But, um, but I, I would say that you know, so far, the performance of the, the C with fast math that we saw and you know, NumPy are essentially the same. Like the, I guess the, the digits after the decimal place um, will, will change considerably um, from, from run to run, even when you're using something that takes an average, like benchmark tools. Um, so we don't have enough information now to say if, if you know, NumPy or, or the optimized C is, is doing better at this point. Um, but in any case, we'll add this NumPy version to our output dictionary, and then we can move on to our handwritten Python, 
um, where we now have our, our Python function declared within, again, a, a string that's now preceded by that pi keyword. Um, and we're calling that sumpy within our current scope, which we can benchmark here. And we're up to like uh, about 900 or 950 milliseconds. Um, so then we can go to Julia. And in Julia, we'll start by looking at the, the built-in version um, of sum within Julia. And this at which macro would tell us where we can actually find the source code um, for, for the sum function. So it's going to be stored in this file, reducedim.jl, um, at line 645. And if you were to go there, you would see that the, uh, the built-in version of sum within Julia is actually written in Julia itself. It's not implemented in a lower level language like C. Um, and if we benchmark the built-in version um, of sum, we're going to get to here about 4.6, 4.7 milliseconds. Uh, so if we add that to our output dictionary, We've got just two left. Uh, one is the, the handwritten uh, of Julia, which again looks really similar to the, you know, our Python implementation of sum. If we benchmark that, we're at about 11.4 milliseconds. And, and finally, uh, if we do exactly what we just did to declare our Julia handwritten version of sum, but we add this at simd macro here, um, we now have a single instruction multiple data version of the, the, the same function that we had above. And benchmarking this, we can see that we, we take it down from a little over 11 to a little over 4 milliseconds. Um, so this is having a comparable effect to the, the addition of the fast math flag that we added to our C code. Um, so having done all that, we, we, can, we can order the performance of all the different runs um, in that output dictionary we've been storing results. And, um, I guess the, the big takeaways here, one of the first is that, um, that Julia's handwritten without any optimization is, is really similar to C's handwritten without any optimization. Um, similarly, if you were to look at um, you know, Julia's built-in, um, that's you know, converging on uh, what we, the sorts of speeds that we're, we're seeing for Python NumPy's with our optimized C code under the hood and this version of our C implementation that has the fast math flag. Um, the, the other thing here that's really cool is that in enabled, or sorry, in, in adding that, that one command, um, the simd uh, macro to our handwritten version of sum in Julia, um, with just that minor modification, we were able to, to really um, start to close this gap between um, our, our simple handwritten implementation and, and, uh, and the built-in here. So really, I think the, the built-in and the one with SIMD are pretty comparable here with the number of cores I have on my machine. But yeah, um, so that's everything for this notebook so far. Um, and we have, we have about five minutes. Um, are people more interested in seeing some of the linear algebra stuff in the next five minutes or talking about multiple dispatch? If you like looking at linear algebra, show your hand. Okay, so there are a couple of people. And if you're more interested in multiple dispatch? Okay. What's multiple dispatch? Sorry? What is multiple dispatch? Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, so, <laughs> um, and then if you want to stick around and look at linear algebra afterwards, I'll still be here. But yeah, we'll, we'll try to talk about multiple dispatch quickly. Um, OK, so before I look at the notebook, um, my first, I guess, sort of like high level overview or like the thing that made multiple dispatch start to click for me a little bit better. Um, OK, yeah, so, so most of you probably haven't heard of multiple dispatch. Um, I hadn't heard of it until I came to Julia. Um, multiple dispatch is sort of a, you might think of it as a generalization of single dispatch, um, where Single dispatch is what's being used in, for example, object-oriented programming. Um, now, uh, are, are people here familiar with like the idea of object-oriented programming, or a lot of you? Okay. Um, so, so the idea of, of single dispatch in that context is that, um, let's say, for example, that you have um, two classes, um, one of dogs and one of cats. And, uh, and of course, you can, you can instantiate an object of the, the cat class um, or of the dog class. And you have methods associated with each of those classes. So for example, we might have a, a say hi method associated with either class. And if we call uh, the function or the method say hi on a cat object, we might get a meow. And if we call the say hi uh, method on the dog 
uh, an object from the dog class will get a bark. Um, and so what's happening there is that um, when, when we make our function call, when we call the function say hi, um, the method that we, we actually get at the end of the day, whether you know, we get the method that generates a meow or the method that generates a bark, um, is determined by a single input argument to our function call, to the function call to say hi. Um, and you know, the syntax in object-oriented programming um, is, is such that you know, that, uh, that input, uh, the, the status of your, your object as being a cat or a dog, looks a little different from your other inputs to your function call. Um, because often you'll say like Fido dot say hi. Um, but even though you're saying Fido dot say hi, Fido is still an input uh, to say hi. And Fido is determining whether you're getting you know, your bark or your, your meow at the end of the day. And so that single dispatch in the sense that, again, there's just a single input argument that's determining which method you get. And so multiple dispatch is a generalization of single dispatch where now instead every single input to your function is going to determine which function uh, or which method associated with that function actually gets dispatched at the end of the day. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit more. Did you have a is question? Like polymorphism? Is Yes, insofar as I understand polymorphism in C++, I think that's fair, but yeah, I, you, you might want to fact check me. <laughs> You're very welcome to fact check all of the things that I say. Um, but okay, so let's, let's talk through some examples of multiple dispatch so I can start to show you what I mean. Um, and, and multiple dispatch is really, um, a lot of people think that Julia is fast because it's just in time compiled instead of interpreted, but, but really it's the design paradigm that's making Julia um, fast. And so, yeah, so we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk through this a bit more. Um, so starting with some things that we've already seen. We've already seen that we can declare a function, for example, a function f that squares things, and we don't have to say, you know, what the function works on. And it will just sort of magically work on things like strings and matrices and numbers, um, but it doesn't work on things like vectors. Um, and again, the, the reason is that, um, you know, we have underlying methods um, associated with, you know, numbers <coughs> and matrices and strings um, that tell us how we would use the star operator and thereby the exponentiation operator on those, those data types. Um, under the hood, and those methods that already exist get called um, when we call f. Uh, but we don't have any method that tells us what to do when we try to exponentiate something that's a vector, and so we get that failure there. Um, now, alternatively, rather than writing a function in, in sort of a generic way and letting Julia you know, figure out when the function works and when it doesn't work on its own, um, we could declare functions in a way where we we specify when we want the function to work um, and where. Um, so for example, we could declare a function called foo. Um, so here, here, this is a declaration for the function foo that takes two inputs x and y. And then I've annotated the inputs x and y with a double colon sign and then the type that I want x and y to be. So I'm saying that x has to be a string and y has to be a string. And, uh, and when I pass strings x and y to foo, I want the printout um, to be my inputs x and y are both strings. And so if I call this function foo that I just declared on the strings hello and hi, I get that printout that I you know, might be expecting. Um, and now if I were to call foo on the integers 3 and 4, um, I get a method error because I didn't declare any function called foo that will take inputs that are, that are both integers. Um, so if I wanted to change that, say, say I want to add a method um, that works on integers 3 and 4, I can now declare foo where I annotate x and y as being both integers here. So I'm saying x double colon int, y double colon int. And now when I pass two integers to foo, uh, I want the printout to say my inputs x and y are both integers. And so I declare that by running this cell. Um, if I call three, uh, foo on 3 and 4, I'm getting that input now that says x and y are both integers. Um, but if I go back and I call foo on hello and hi, uh, we still get that output saying that x and y are both strings. And the reason is that when I declared foo here, I didn't overwrite my first definition of foo. I didn't replace it with this new definition. Um, I was able to just add an extra definition to, to a function that I had already written. 
And I can add you know, as many different definitions for one function name as there are possible combinations um, of you know, possibly infinite input arguments to, to a function. Um, so, so if you want to see, oh, and I guess maybe, maybe the, the first thing to say here is that, um, so, so really the, the fundamental idea here is that we have this distinction then between generic functions and methods. Um, where generic functions are really you know, sort of the, the abstract concepts that we have tied to particular operations. Like we have in our minds what it means to add things together or to multiply things together. Um, but then on a computer, you know, we need concrete, um, concrete ways of adding together you know, two different floating point numbers. That's going to be different from how we add together two different integers. Um, and so you know, our, our specific implementations of how to do any given operation are our methods. And, and our functions are, are, are more abstract or more generic. And so that means that we as users can just think about these sort of generic function calls. Uh, we can just think about the fact that we want to add things together. And we don't have to specify that we want you know, the type of addition that's meant for integers or the type of addition that's meant for one integer and one float. But the compiler, at the time that it looks at our code, is going to realize that it needs to um, dispatch you know, a particular method that's you know, well-tuned for those inputs. Um, now, if you want to see you know, what methods exist for a particular function, you can use this methods function on a function name. Uh, so if we call methods on foo, we can see that there are two versions of foo, foo sitting around, which are the two that I declared, one for integers and one for strings. Um, if you were to call methods on the plus operator, you would see that there are 163 different ways um, to, to add things together in Julia, um, where this includes, you know, adding float 32s to float 32s and, and adding something that's a missing, a missing uh, data point to another missing um, and so forth. So this is basically just a, a huge combinatorics problem here. Um, and now we have this other function, or macro rather, called uh, at which, which <laughs> when we call at which on a piece of code, it's going to tell us which function actually got dispatched for a, a given set of input arguments. So if I call at which on foo of three and four, uh, the version of foo that gets dispatched is, is the method that's written for in64 and in64. Uh, if I call at which on 3.0 plus 3.0, we can see that the version of addition that's being used there is the version that's written specifically for float64s. Um, and now, uh, I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, but I sort of glossed over it, um, the fact that Julia has you know, a type hierarchy where at the very top there's the any abstract type that encompasses all other types. Um, there are other, uh, within that tree, there are other uh, abstract types, like, like number, for example, where um, the number type encompasses you know, all integers and all floating points and all complex numbers. Um, so we can also declare methods for, um, for other abstract types. Um, so I could, for example, declare a version of this function called foo that takes x and y that are both numbers. And then uh, when x and y are both numbers, I want this printout to be x and y are both numbers. Um, so what happens now that I've declared foo in this way is that if I were to call foo on two floating point numbers, um, I, I end up dispatching the, the, the version that was written for numbers because floating points are, are subtypes of number. Um, but we're always going to get the most, uh, I guess, specific method or the most well-tailored method uh, that exists for a given set of inputs. Um, so for example, if I declare foo without specifying what the inputs are, if I you know, go to just foo of x and y, um, at this point, if I were to say foo on 3 and 4, um, I'll still get the, the integer version, even though you know, this one is sort of all-encompassing. Um, but now the all-encompassing one that I've declared there provides sort of a fallback method for things I haven't thought of yet. Like if I pass a, a vector now, um, the only method for which a vector will work as an input is, is that more all-encompassing generic version of foo that I wrote here without any type annotations. So that's a lot of information. Um, <laughs> are there questions? I'm not sure there are questions, but. <laughs> questions. Yeah. Add one, like, wrong, like, 
Um, there's not a way to delete a method once you've added it. You can easily overwrite it. And if you, if for example, if you accidentally overwrote addition, uh, which you, you could do, um, then you would just have to restart your REPL or your notebook that you were working in. Um, and then you would have a clean slate after that. Um, but yeah. Yes? At some point you had a curling import sign. How do you detect that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That uh, should be, I'm really bad at tab completion. I like, don't hold the keys the right amount. I think you should do slash and then colon. Um, and then if you start to write approx, and then, I swear, other people do this and it works. Um, tab, tab, tab. You should be able to just hit tab <laughs> and then it should give you the curly braces. I can't, I've, I've failed at this in, in live demos so many times and then often there's someone else that knows Julia th from the audience that will come up and like do the tab completion for me and they give me the instructions and I'm like, that's what I was doing, but so yes, I'm sorry. Um, that's how it works. Sorry? No colon? Does it work without the colon? Oh, okay. So uh, th yep, that's, that's why I broke it this time. Find a way to break it every time. Thank you. There's the curly braces. And I wonder, I want to see if I do smiley. Oh, I wanted to do smiley cat and I got just a smile. But yeah, anyways, that's how you tap complete. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm just still kind of curious about the speed. So you said it's not uh, like a JIT. It's not just in time compilation. Is it kind of like a Java thing, or like a Java virtual machine? Or I mean, I know there's different reasons that it's fast, but I'm still unclear about why. Why oh. to C speed? Sorry. Um, and uh, what I said earlier, or what I meant to say earlier, was um, it, it is just in time compiled. Mm -hmm. But I meant that's not the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, that that alone wouldn't make a language fat if, fast if it were not well designed. Um, but OK, so given that, uh, it does answer your question? Oh, OK, good. Awesome. Other questions? OK. Um, does anyone want to look at linear algebra or stick around, or you want to? It's, it's late, and it's dinner time. Yeah. OK, well, then we're done. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.